C uh, for K through 12, uh, an MATSL program. Well, that's okay, no, no problems. I'm sure everybody's got a different functionality. Um, but we assume that you are all TESOL professionals, which is um, who we're here to, to uh, tell more about this amazing program for. So let me go on. Uh, presenters today are myself, Tony Hull. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of English Language Programs. And uh, I also have with me Chad Boosley, who is the virtual, uh, virtual project alum. Uh, he uh, had did a virtual project in China or virtually in China 2020 through 2021 and he's going to tell you more about his program in just a few minutes. Um, as I said, this is the virtual educator program, as you can see, it is brand new. Uh, we are uh, really just launching it this year in so much as we're recruiting for it this year in 2021. Um, but we are. Uh, its first full year will be in 2022. So we are recruiting for people who will work in the academic year of 2022 um, and uh, through 2023. Um, but this program came as a result really of COVID. Uh, it's, I don't quite know how to talk about a silver lining of COVID. There isn't one, but if there is, this is it. Uh, we were forced to go to um, uh, uh, only virtual programming during COVID. And um, as a result, we learned that actually this was a great niche for us, that there's a lot of interest with our programs overseas um, to, to have Americans uh, who are sitting in the United States, um, but to go online and teach academic courses, uh, do um, workshops with teachers associations, uh, and to do cultural exchange uh, at American corners, et cetera, and sharing American history and culture and ideas. Um, and th there's a whole, op um, whole world of opportunity there. So we are now exploring that. And so the virtual educator is now one of our three programs. And we also have the fellow program and the specialist program, um, which are primarily in country, though once again, uh, we, we've been virtual with those for the past year as well. Um, the program, English language programs itself, uh, is um, fellow program is 50 years old, the specialist program is 30 years old, and, and now today you're going to learn about this one year old program. So we'll get into that right now. I do want to say right from the start that we'll go into more details later. The eligibility for the virtual educator program is being a US citizen and having a graduate degree in TESOL or related field or other qualifying credentials. Um, and then at least five years of experience in education in general and three specifically in ESL or EFL classroom teaching. So that's a, a specific that you want to profile right from the start. All right, next up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about projects in general and then turn it over to Chad. Um, the virtual projects, just as it says, are 100% online. Uh, an American teacher in TESOL working uh, very often with classroom situations. So it might be language skills, it's often also methodology in, in TESOL. And the hours are definitely part time. This is not a full time position. It's up to 10 hours of contact uh, with students, the learners who might be um, BA students, MA students um, in the TESOL field, it's very common, or other community members. Um, all of our projects offer cultural exchange just by virtue of your being an American and working with these international communities. So it's very much about um, the, the opportunities for Americans to get to know uh, people in another country and, and vice, or, uh, vice versa. Um, and all of our projects are designed by US embassies locally. So they're, they're very specifically designed to meet the needs of the local institutions that the, uh, the alumni, the uh, participants work with. And uh, another major factor is you're part of that public diplomacy mission of the embassy. And really, it's just being the American in the room as much as anything else. Um, but sometimes it's more explicit. Also, you may actually participate in events with the embassy where it's, it's more um, there's a more explicit uh, role of representing the United States. 
And finally, um, the virtual educator programs, all of our programs for English language programs offer amazing professional opportunities for people, professional development opportunities. Often you're being asked to do something you've never done before. It might be making a plenary speech. It certainly is designing courses that you may have taken, but you've never actually taught. Um, and uh, it's certainly working in a, probably a different environment uh, than you ever had before. So, um, and then there's also an amazing community that you will belong to as a result of being a participant in our program. So a, definitely a career development opportunity for you. And I think you're about to, I'm, I'm, I've seen Brad's presentation, and, uh, excuse me, Chad, and he, he, he hits every single one of those points. So I'm gonna turn it over to him at this point. Um, Chad, tell us about your project. But first, Great. let me tell you a little bit about Chad, sorry. Um, Chad is one of our um, alumni. I think you finished your project. Is that right, Chad? That is correct. I finished, finished. July 3rd of 2021. Okay, so um, he is no longer a participant, but very recent one. He's an ESL instructor and e-learning specialist currently working at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Chad served as a virtual educator language fellow from 2020 to 2021 with Shandong Normal University in I don't know the pronunciation, Yinan, China, where he taught first year speaking and listening courses and two sections of graduate level courses on theories and approaches in second language acquisition. His favorite thing about the virtual educator program was learning about the students home culture and teaching them fun and exciting idioms and songs in English. Uh, during the 2018 2019 academic year, Chad taught at a technical high school in Chomuto, Czech Republic as a Fulbright English teaching assistant, where he facilitated extracurricular activities for students, such as an English technology club and also an English course for teachers at the school. When Chad isn't trying our, out new technology for teaching or working with faculty and students, he can be found at a campsite with his converted camper van, a cozy fire, and an acoustic guitar by his side. That's a super introduction, and now I will turn it over to Chad. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tony. I'm so happy to be here to talk about this fantastic program with all of you this morning. Uh, and so here, just to start off, I have three slides to kind of paint a picture of what your uh, you know, virtual educator program might look like. So I am sitting currently at my kind of teaching office, right? Um, with my, uh, this first picture here on the left, the textbook you see on the table, that's actually a textbook I used with my graduate students. And, uh, and that was a big hit with them. Um, you know, I got my microphone, as you can see here, I do some audio work just kind of for fun on the side, but I thought it was nice to just have some crisp, clear audio. You can obviously, you know, achieve that with like a simple headset as well. Um, and then as well, uh, I have my um, notepad there to uh, take any notes and feedback while I was teaching for my students, which came in really, really handy. As you can see, I kept my setup very, very simple. I know some folks use two, maybe even three display monitors. Uh, I just simply wanted to have a screen so I could really focus on uh, just giving my lecture and not having too many moving parts there. And speaking of the lecture, that's what you see kind of in the middle of the screen there. So because I was teaching in China, well, virtually in China, right? Uh, VUV was the best kind of teleconferencing tool that I used. Zoom, there were some connectivity issues. Some students had difficulties joining. So VUV was a great way for us to meet synchronously and have our discussions, our class activities. And uh, we also did some uh, informal conversation hours outside of class as well. Um, because that's what the students requested. And I will say straight off the bat, one of the biggest challenges, at least for me personally, with my program in China, is there was no learner management system available. So WeChat kind of became my kind of makeshift or de facto learner management system. And it worked out perfectly to send files to my students. Students could ask us questions. And here you can see I have the different groups pinned at the top. So one of them is uh, the all of the students in my freshman oral English class, that 2020 English class, SDNU. The SDNU stands for Shandong Normal University. Then the SLA was my graduate course. Then the uh, I was lucky enough to have a couple teaching assistants because my program, my program was a little bit of an anomaly to my understanding just because of the circumstances with COVID and everything else. I actually was teaching about 200 freshman students in my oral English class. 
Uh, I'm assuming moving forward that probably won't be happening to any of you if you are um, if you take this great opportunity as a virtual educator. Um, but this was kind of a um, you know because of COVID, no foreign teachers could come to China, so I was I was kind of their main contact point for those uh, speaking and listening classes. But I was very fortunate to have those teaching assistants to help me uh, just organize things. They also helped facilitate some in-class activities as well. Um, so yeah, so this is just kind of a quick little snapshot of, you know, what it might look like for you as a virtual educator. You know, you'll have your your uh, great home office, which is awesome, and then you know some type of tech tool, whether it be Zoom, Teams, Move in my case, and uh, and some way to stay in contact with all of your students as well. And so here are a couple of pictures that kind of encapsulate the what it's like to be a virtual educator. So as I mentioned, I had some teaching assistants, which uh, we were able to actually facilitate more activities in class. So here I have the students doing uh, one of my favorite kind of warm up activities, which is called a vocabulary race. Uh, some folks call it a blackboard race, where uh, you split the students into teams. And then I think for this week, we were talking about personality traits. Uh, and so the students, as you can see, were writing words like outgoing on the board. Uh, and then going back to their classmates, um, handing off the chalk and then continuing to write. So that was really, really useful. And I got a lot of great feedback from my students about um, kind of the combination of, you know, prepping and learning all of the vocabulary online with me and then practicing it with the teaching assistants in the classroom, which was fantastic. And then that other picture on the left there, um, my last day as a lecturer for the uh, virtual educator program. It was a, a, a request by numerous students of mine. Uh, you know, Mr. B, will you please play guitar for us for the last day of class? And so I decided, okay, you know what, I might as well. And uh, unbeknownst to me, one of my students um, enjoyed the performance so much, she decided to take a screenshot. Um, you can't really see the guitar because of the, the virtual background I have there, but um, she decided to take a picture and sent me like a nice little thank you note. And this really highlights that, you know, you get to, even though it's virtual, you get to have this great um, connection that you can build with your students, right? You can build quite a rapport with them. We talked a lot about music and they shared some Chinese music with me. I shared a lot of different uh, recommendations for uh, American music, whether that be from the United States or from uh, Great Britain. And then it was just so much fun to um, play music for the students. They really enjoyed it. And uh, one of my students actually was uh, asking me if we could do um, like a karaoke hour, which I would have loved to do, but unfortunately my program had already ended at that point. Uh, but it was just a lot of fun to be able to relate to the students and also find out what music they enjoyed. And that also gave me a little bit of insight to what other music I could kind of show them and we could discuss a little bit. So it was a lot of fun. So one, one of the biggest challenges as a virtual educator is finding ways to not only get your students engaged in the course, but also get them to practice whatever language skills they're doing, right? And for me, I was teaching a speaking and listening class, and I used uh, Flipgrid, which this is just kind of a snapshot of all of the different Flipgrid assignments we did throughout the semester with my freshman oral English class. And it was so much fun to... Uh, watch my students' videos. I had them do an introduction video, so it was great to kind of get to know them. I asked them about, you know, where are they from? Is there a story about their name? And uh, a lot of uh, students in China, they're, uh, usually it's either the grandfather or grandmother tend to give them their name, not always, but I had numerous students who said, you know, oh, my grandmother and my grandfather picked this name because and it was really interesting to just hear all these stories uh, and just, you know, make that uh, connection and build that rapport with the students, which was so much fun. And then these other topics you can see here, expressing opinions, U.S. holidays, Chinese holidays, these were all related to what we were discussing each week in the class. And I have to say my personal favorite, other than the introductions, was, well, it's probably a toss-up between Chinese holidays and food. Uh, a lot of my students were foodies, and so it was so great to just hear about the different dishes they love to eat and they love to try. And they had a lot of questions about American food. So it was fun to be able to field those questions and, and discuss those. And the Chinese holidays was great because that's a, a perfect way for that cultural exchange, right? So I got to learn a lot about Chinese New Year, about um, Mid-Autumn Festival, 
Uh, there were uh, a lot of really, really great things there. So Flipgrid is a, definitely a tool I would recommend for someone doing a virtual program like this. And it was just a great way as well to be able to discuss asynchronously, you know, when I would teach virtually because of uh, some of the issues with uh, bandwidth uh, and also students just internet data, a lot of them had their cameras off. So this was a way for me to actually see their faces, kind of get to know them on a deeper level um, and just also make it so they felt more comfortable approaching me and talking to me in the live lectures or asking me questions on WeChat. And uh, it was really, really great. So I would highly recommend Flipgrid for any of you thinking about using um, or, or um, taking on this uh, virtual program. So speaking of that, I do have, I wanted to give you all some, just some quick recommendations. I myself am an e-learning specialist as well. And so for me, I look a lot at different technologies to use in teaching. And Flipgrid is fantastic for discussions or also for presentations. I had my graduate student course actually do some presentations with their Flipgrids, which was great because students could go back and watch them again. Live lectures, obviously you want some type of teleconferencing tool. Zoom, Voov was the one that I used, which is basically, it's more or less the Chinese version of Zoom. I mean, there's like a chat. I think now they have breakout rooms as well. Um, so it's really, really useful. And one of my absolute favorite tools when it comes to just games and comprehension checks is Kahoot, which is basically an online interactive quiz game. I use the free version because uh, I guess because I'm cheap and I like to, um, you know, keep things simple. Although there is a program allowance and I'm sure Tony will talk about that later on as well. Um, so you could, if you wanted to get an upgraded version, that might be an option for you. Um, I'm not fully sure, so I won't speak too much more on that, but Tony, I'm sure can touch on that in a little bit. And then I would highly recommend, so for me, I just used Excel and WeChat basically to keep tabs on everything for attendance and grading. But if possible, I would highly recommend some type of a learning management system if it's possible. It will just keep everything nice and organized for you and your students. They'll be able to see their grades more quickly instead of me having to send you know 200 students their grades uh so it's it's very very different uh when you have a, a up and running learning management system but i also will say that my contacts at the university in beijing were of great help to uh just kind of um come together and strategize how we could better organize things without a learner management system so if it isn't an option uh, you will have support there to help you as well so just keep that in mind. And, and I have to really give my colleagues in Beijing a lot of credit because they, they were just of great help and assistance throughout this entire program. So one other tip I wanted to give all of you today is one of my favorite online pronunciation activities that I would do with my students. Uh, this is called a minimal pair tree. Uh, some folks call it a minimal pair maze. I like the term tree because I guess it kind of goes down um, kind of like a tree. But anyways, with this, the way it works is I would demonstrate the vocabulary with the students. So I would, you know, say sheep, show, sheet, shoot. And then I would ask the students, okay, what number? So they follow the tree down and then they would obviously say number one, right? And the great thing about this is you can pick minimal pairs that your students have difficulty pronouncing, right? Um, so you can make this very individualized based off of the learners or based off of your class. And the other fantastic thing about this is I had a lot of difficulty in the beginning uh, with my students volunteering. I had to just call on them, which can be a little tiresome sometimes. And so the great thing about this activity is the students got so excited to practice their pronunciation and get feedback from a native speaker that I had my students volunteering over and over and over again. And it got to a point where I could only take a few students because so many were volunteering. So it was a complete shift in the way um, my other activities had been going online. It wasn't so much me saying, um, okay, uh, Jenny, can you answer this? Um, it's, you know, my students would say, okay, Mr. B, I would love to try this. And so we would have them go through. And the other great thing about this activity is if there is a breakdown. So if your students say, uh, uh, one number and it's incorrect, you can actually go back through the uh, minimal pair tree and find exactly where that mistake was. So you can pinpoint and, and also figure out, is it a pronunciation issue or is it a listening issue? Because it could be either of those. 
So I just wanted to share this other tip with all of you, because if you teach uh, any speaking or listening classes, this could be a really useful tool for all of you moving forward. And the uh, other thing I want to address regarding the uh, virtual programs is uh, once again, I mean, I've already said it today, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record here, but really one of the best benefits is just working with such great students. You know, they're so excited to have, uh, you know, an American there teaching them English. They asked me so many great, thoughtful questions about American culture. Uh, some of the topics were a little difficult to address. Um, you know, they, they asked me questions about, you know, police brutality and gun violence and a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, I would not have initially thought of um, to discuss, but it, you know, opened up a lot of great opportunities. And this picture here is actually taken from my conversation hours, which was basically I had, I believe it was, it was either two or four hours a week where I would uh, wake up in the morning and we would just have an informal conversation. It wasn't required for my students. It was optional, but I did this because I had given them a survey and they let me know, you know, Mr. B, I would really love to uh, just have more individual time working with you and speaking with you. And so I thought, well, how can we accomplish this? Because I mean, Flipgrid is great, but there's a bit of a lag because it's asynchronously and it's just not the same as a conversation like we're having. And so uh, I thought, well, OK, I have some contact hours remaining in the week. Why don't we set up these conversation hours? And so students would come and we would just chat. And it was a lot of fun. Students would, uh, you know, show me their dorm room and introduce me to their roommates. And, uh, you know, uh, I had a couple of students one time join from dinner, which was a lot of fun. And um, it was just really great. So I would highly recommend, you know, when you can uh, take that extra time or just plan for that extra time to connect with your students, um, you'll learn a lot from them as well. I mean, I learned so much about Chinese culture, um, also some different activities that they use a lot in China. Um, so it was a really, really great experience uh, doing these conversation hours. So to kind of end my, my part of the presentation today, I did want to list some of the positives and also some of the challenges. You know, the, the, the big key for me here was just working with such fantastic students. Uh, and the great thing is, depending on how you set up your course, you can do a lot of work with them either synchronously via Zoom like we're doing or asynchronously, whether that be writing assignments, whether that be Flipgrid assignments. There's just so many different opportunities where you can work with the students, help them achieve their academic goals. Uh, and it was really, really amazing for me just seeing how much my students' English had improved from the beginning of the semester until the end of the semester. And uh, when I gave a survey, I asked them, how they felt about their confidence for just speaking English to a native speaker. And for many of my students, um, I should have known this, but it was a bit of a surprise. I was the first native speaker many of them had interacted with. And they had said initially they were very anxious and felt a little nervous and intimidated to speak with a native speaker. But by the end of the semester, I, I mean, I could tell personally just from the conversations and the questions they would have for me. Um, so it was really great just working with the students and helping them improve their English skills. I enjoy teaching about US culture. I'm a big music fan myself. So that's one of the parts of culture I love to talk about. I love to eat as well. So talking about food is always a fun aspect of sharing cultures. And it was so great to just learn about my students culture as well. And I had some students that were in minority groups in China. So I had a student from Tibet. I had a student from um, Xinjiang who was a Uyghur. Uh, so it was really interesting to just get their perspective as well, which was really great and learn about their cultures. And the other thing too, is I was able to develop relationships with faculty. When I say faculty here, I mean professors at Shandong Normal University. They would reach out to me. We would share materials. We even met on Zoom a few times to just discuss some different things. Um, and it was just a great relationship to have with these faculty. A lot of those teachers were much more experienced than I was. So I also could ask them if I needed help or needed some recommendations for, you know, different activities or things to do in the classroom. And it was so great to just work with these faculty. I had one faculty member join uh, just kind of to audit my graduate uh, second language acquisition course. And she was also such a great person to have in the course because she was a wonderful resource. She would add so much to the discussion and the graduate students, I think, really appreciated that as well. So, you know, these are really the big positives here. And at the end of the day, I think that that human connection with the faculty and with the students is just such a great thing about this program. 
So there are a few challenges. I just want to make all of you aware of those because um, life isn't always just sunshine and rainbows, unfortunately. And so one of the biggest challenges for me was the time difference. So China, depending on daylight savings time, is 12 or 13 hours difference. So uh, I had to remember, you know, if my student said, yeah, I want to talk to you on Monday, that meant Sunday night for me, right? If, at least if it was Monday morning. Also, as I've already mentioned, not having a learner management system I just had to be very on top of my organization, uh, making sure I had very designated folders to keep all of the assignments and everything. And having a learner management system would certainly make things a little bit more smooth, but it certainly is possible to teach you know, an academic course without one. And then the last thing too is internet connectivity issues. I mean, yes, that happens on our end, but it was an even bigger problem in China just because a lot of my students were joining from their mobile phones meaning that they were using actually their own data. So that's why a lot of my students had their cameras off when we would meet. And, uh, and I just had to adjust with that and keep those internet connectivity issues in mind. So uh, I believe that's all I have for you all today. Uh, so thank you all so much for listening. And I look forward to answering any questions you have about the program later during the presentation. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm muted, right? Thank you so much, Chad. As I said in my introduction to him, I think he represents every aspect of what we want you to learn about this program in terms of the kinds of primary duties you might have and, and just the kinds of cultural exchange that's possible, even in a totally virtual environment. Um, and so this was a great, a great model for you um, to, to learn about the program. Um, now I'm going to spend about five minutes rushing, I think, through some of the nuts and bolts, just so you know what's uh, a little bit more of the context. As I said earlier, um, this is a U.S. Department of State program, part of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And uh, as a virtual educator, you would be uh, a member of more than 50,000 participants in the United in the State Department's international exchange programs each year going in, in both directions of international and cultural exchange. Um, the virtual educator projects are all designed by the US embassies and they vary from country to country based on the local needs. As, as um, Chad mentioned, his project was very much designed at a very specific time, the beginning of COVID to fill a very specific need at his host institution. And that's true for all of the projects. They, they really are about what does your local um, host or partner need at this particular time. Um, but they all involve developing the local, the English language capacity and the teaching capacity of the local community. Um, and at the same time, you're building mutual understanding between the Amer America, Americans, and um, the country that you're, you're working with and that you're, um, you're virtually in. Uh, and as you can see from Chad, there are all kinds of opportunities to do that virtually. Um, all of them include some teacher training in, in some degree, whether you're working with BA or master's degree students who are indeed themselves future teachers or current teachers, or maybe working with a teacher's association and doing workshops with them. There's always some teacher training going on. Um, the, let me, I'm just definitely another place for my script here. Um, so the, the projects themselves vary. Uh, Chad had a fairly long one. Some of them may be only a month where you're doing a series of workshops with the teachers association, but many are indeed for an entire semester where you are teaching a specific academic course for um, an institution, but maybe probably some other secondary duties where you're doing a workshop here or going to the American corner and doing a cultural event somewhere else. Um, we definitely expect that you will expand your own skill sets and just generally your own experiences in this world. Um, you have a really unique opportunity to enhance your career, whether it's just learning how to do um, classroom management at a very large scale, such as Chad did, or, um, or doing a plenary speech or designing a course you've never taught before. Um, now, there are some basics. Uh, Chad started by showing you his workspace, and that's always a major part of this for everybody. Um, you need to provide your own workspace and your own equipment. Um, and everybody explores what are the best digital tools that they will need for their project. 
uh, and they will vary depending upon the project. Um, and out of that, you'll be able to cross all sorts of amazing borders. Um, the projects are all over the world virtually, um, and always you have a host institution, usually a university, but it may be a teacher's college, it may be a teacher's association, it may be an American center, um, and uh, the goals will, will absolutely be in line with the local embassy's expectations for that country and, and the things that they're trying to accomplish in that country. Um, so we go to both for the in-person and virtual um, country, uh, projects to all of these amazing countries. Um, and you're always uh, assigned to one institution, as I said. One thing to note, you're never working uh, with or in a K through 12 setting. You're never teaching children themselves. You may visit schools to be an observer, to be a mentor to teachers, but um, and you're certainly working with teachers who teach in a K through 12 setting, but you yourself will, um, are not a K through 12 teacher through the virtual education program. Um, as Chad mentioned, time zones are a big issue. So uh, you may be, of course, all of you are here in this um, Eastern Standard Time, but you could be teaching in, in the same time zone, uh, on a time zone all the way across the world. And um, when, when you apply, you will be able to indicate what, where you're located and what time zones locally for you, you'd be available. And then we will do the best we can to match you to that. The greater flexibility you have, the better. So I think you know sometimes you're getting up a little earlier in the morning than you like, and sometimes you may be teaching, you know, at 10 p.m. Uh, but it's up to you to decide whether that's uh, going to be convenient for you for a couple of months or not. Um, okay, so we already covered this to some degree, which is the variety of projects. They all vary quite a lot. And um, there are uh, the current rules. This may have been different for Chad because he was part of our sort of beta year as we developed this project. But with the new virtual educator project, which officially begins with the 22-23 academic year, um, there is a maximum of 10 contact hours per week and then 10 preparation or grading hours, whatever it is, you know, 10 more hours that we will pay you for um to to you know prepare for your course and do all the uh, ancillary requirements um we we are always looking for people who are flexible resourceful and responsive to the needs of their host institutions and their students which uh chad you know absolutely showed us so well um is qualities well well used and then as i said earlier teacher training cultural exchange public diplomacy and professional development all of these things are just built into the projects, opportunities to do those things. Now, some really important information, I'm sure, that you all want to have. And I'm also going to share something important with you right now in the chat, just in case um, I forget later, which is we have a great website and we'd love for you to sign up for our newsletter. We send out a newsletter to people interested in the program four times a year which mostly is useful because we'll be reminding you where we are in the hiring cycle and uh, you don't want to miss our deadlines and, and this will help you know, you know, what do you, what should you do next if you're really interested in this. So program benefits, we pay $35 per hour, uh, that too has changed a little bit over the year so Chad may be thinking hmm that's interesting, but this is um, $35 uh, for those contact and prep hours. And then, as Chad mentioned, there's a pre-project planning uh, allowance as well. If indeed you really do need a specific software um, uh, that in order to perform your course, and we may pay for that as well. Um, oh, well, uh, sorry, there's a pre-project because you need to create your course. And then the activities allowance is what he referred to, where we may be able to help you if you need specific software or tools. Um, we also are going to be um, offering all of our virtual educators a TESOL Global membership, not only for yourself, but also for uh, one of your counterparts, a student or a colleague at your university. And we found that this is a really nice a way to build a relationship with somebody and, and support their own professional development. And so this is a, a new, a new um, benefit as well. Then, uh, again, um, I don't think Chad mentioned this, but I want to, uh, I'll mention something about him when I'm reviewing these, the professional development opportunities. 
So there is a orientation, of course, um, which is both about what it is like to be a member of this public diplomacy mission, and then the nuts and bolts of how you're going to get paid and reports that you have to do. And then monthly, approximately monthly, there's a virtual fellow forum. And indeed, Chad was one of our presenters at an early virtual fellow forum where <clears throat> we have one presenter share a tip, um, some great um, tool that he or she uses for uh, teaching uh, and, um, and then an opportunity for everybody who's a current uh, virtual educator to come together and share stories and, and, and support each other. Um, there's also a training of trainers course. Um, Chad, did you do that? I think you said you did. So we have. I did, a, yeah, it was fantastic. We have a training of trainers course, and depending upon the timing of your project, it may become before your project, during your project, um, but it, it certainly will help you because even though we're all professionals, this idea of training new other teachers may be new, and certainly in this context. So it's really about you know doing something in a completely new context. And then we have a wonderful online community of practice with lots of resources, um, special online events and opportunities for discussion and just sharing your stories. Um, eligibility, as I said earlier, is a minimum of a graduate degree, ideally or often in TESOL or related field. If it's not in a TESOL or related field, you may also qualify still with some kind of graduate degree, master's or higher in a uh, with a state credential or a certificate at least five years of experience in education at least three of those in a classroom um, setting for esl or efl and then this is a public diplomacy project for the u.s department of state so just u.s citizens are qualified okay now the application timeline is a really important one to be thinking about so we are recruiting for uh, the 22-23 academic year. So the first uh, virtual educators in the 22-23 year will actually go out in August of 2022, and then could be staggered throughout the year of their start dates. Um, so with that in mind, our application is going to open spring 2022. So a fairly long time from now. Um, so please, that's why really signing up for the newsletter would be really smart, because we'll remind you. Um, but this is partly because uh, so far ahead, because we don't even have the projects yet. The projects really are designed to meet the needs of the next academic year. So we're waiting to get those projects in so we know exactly what's needed, what kind of educator is needed. And then, of course, your own schedule isn't really known for the coming year until later. So look for the application to open on our website, which I shared, um, spring 2022. And you can only apply online. It, it's, a, it's a rather um, uh, rigorous application process. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit um, here. Um, there are a lot of questions, statements of purpose, and um, a lot of questions that really ask you to identify all the skill sets and experiences you have. And the more time you thinking, think about this, the, better, uh, light, the more likely you are to be matched to a great project because we really depend on the information that you supply um, to, to match you to a project that's suitable. Um, two references are required, two professional references are required, one from a recent or current supervisor. Um, what else? Um, oh yes, then the, the actual what happens after you apply. Um, so the, the two references, it's, there's a, a review process by peers, people who have been educators themselves in our program, and there will be an interview. If you pass eligibility, there will be an interview to learn more about your experience uh, with a really strong focus on things like flexibility and adaptability, especially as, as, Chad, as Chad mentioned, all the things you don't know you're going to need that you, you have to figure out within two or three days before the next class. Um, so we, we want people who are fast on their feet, for sure. Um, and then just a real eagerness to participate in this kind of project. Um, once you have been, if, if you pass all of those stages of review, you're put into the pool. And then when we start matching, which we expect would be in May, um, then you would be, if you are matched to a project, your your resume, et cetera, your whole application is sent to a embassy and embassies, excuse me, if they're interested in you would also set up an interview. 
and then they are the ones who actually make the selections. Um, and uh, all of that process takes a couple of months. Uh, so it's all so from the time that you apply to the time that maybe you're matched to a project, it's it's maybe three or four months, and um, it's uh, it's 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 intense. So be ready <laughs> to uh, to respond to an email or um, um, and then as uh, the the prep time. Um, I think I'm now down. I have actually only two or three minutes left for for questions but would be happy to have any questions that you might have i see a few have come in um so i see that patrick's already answered i mean uh, chad's already answered patrick's question um anything else in the chat box or just turn off your uh turn on your microphone either one would be fine i have a question this is stephanie mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is there training provided for use of digital tools? Not training per se. Um, during the before your project, not not really. There is a a, a, a virtual. No, <laughs> I, I think the answer is, is pretty confidently no, um, because it, it very much varies on what your project is, what is going to be um, needed. So we don't uh, specifically um, uh, have any training. So you know we expect everybody pretty much in this day and age to be comfortable in doing exactly what we're doing now. If, if you can you know do the basics of Zoom, you base you are about you have the most minimum requirement um, there is. But every project needs something else. And um, but on the other hand, once you are selected, you have access to our community of practice. And we have many recordings now from people like Chad sharing the amazing things that they've been doing. So once you've been selected, you could spend time on the community of practice looking at these recordings, looking at all the other resources that have been posted there by past and current participants and learning from them how they're troubleshooting different kinds of things. How do I do an academic writing class online, for example? Um, but it also may depend quite a lot on your own host institution and what their expectations are. They may, they may say anything you want is good with us, and they may say this is the platform to use, and that's all there is to it. So it, it varies quite a lot. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. And Chad has very nicely shared his, um, his email if you all want to, to contact him. Um, I think we, we probably should wrap up. I've shared already a few times, but I'll do it one more time. Our website, which also has, um, you can also just write directly to the virtual educator program. Let me type this in. If you have any lingering questions, that would get you most directly to somebody who can answer your question. Um, if by any chance you're interested in being a 10 month in country fellow, we're doing another presentation this afternoon at two o'clock for that. Um, and uh, so please, please come there as well. So thank one you. One more question, one more question. Stephanie. Would you be considered an employee of the State Department or you're a contractor? You are a contractor. Okay. You're a really good question, you're a contractor. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, super. Well, thank you all very much for coming and I wanna thank Chad very much for being uh, a guinea pig for us. We. It's a new program, so a new presentation, and uh, he, he really has done a great job, I assure you, of, of introducing you to this amazing opportunity. So thanks, Chad. Thank you, uh, Tony. We'll be in touch again soon, I know. And thank you, Greer, to uh, Watt Tiesel for, for hosting us. We know this is a fairly small uh, group, but um, I think that's, uh, that's fine with us, I assure you. We, we, we know um, that the trickle out effect, tell your friends and neighbors, and uh, we'll hope to see you in our program soon. Yeah, thank you. It was a very thorough presentation. And thank you, Chad. That was um, fascinating, wonderful. Um, I can tell you're really enthusiastic about it. So um, I didn't even know all of the details about it. So I learned a lot myself. Right. So thank well, you, everybody, thank you, for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Take care, guys.